All right. You, all right. I didn't know you wanted to hear me so much. All right. <laughs> all right. But yeah, as I was thinking about the message here, as uh, this person here that Solomon is addressing, uh, you know, who, who is free from sin? Who can make their own selves clean? And the answer is no one. So a rhetorical question is what it is. And as I was studying here for the, for the message, I came across this illustration thinking about back in the World War II days. Uh, of course, there was a lot of atrocities and uh, things that were going on back then. Uh, particularly with the Nazis and Adolf Hitler, uh, uh, at the end he he uh, lost his life, and of course they're they're trying people for war crimes. Several of them tried to escape. One of them was a guy by the name of Adolf Eichmann, and of course uh, he tried to escape over to Argentina. Gave him a new name that he was going by at the time, Roberto. Um, what was his last name? Uh, I forget, it escapes me. But uh, anyway, he, he, he had this alias that he was going by as he was living in Argentina. But uh, one of the Holocaust survivors spotted him, knew who he was, and turned him in to the authorities. Brought back to Israel, and he was uh, going to go before trial. 1961 is when all this was taking place. And so, 1961, he's standing trial there in Israel. I mean, it had to be quite a sight to see. And, uh, but nonetheless, there was a guy that was there, a Jewish man. He wanted to go see the trial for himself. And he began to sit in and listen and overhear uh, what was going on during this trial. And this gentleman here, this Jewish man who was present, began to burst out in tears. And the guy next to him, he said, man, I, I, I know it must be upsetting for you. You must be really, really angry uh, by the testimonies and the things that you're hearing. And uh, it must be unbearable for you to hear. And uh, the guy that was being addressed there, he said this, surprisingly, he says, no, it isn't anger that I'm dealing with. It isn't anger that's got me upset. He says, the longer that I sit here, the more I realize that I have a heart that's not much different than that guy. And that's coming from a Jewish individual talking about a guy that's been persecuted. A lot of the people, I mean, he, he, he was known for killing millions and millions and millions of innocent Jewish people all throughout Europe. And he makes this astonishing admission and it shows us how desperately wicked our hearts really are. I mean, we could realize that from Scripture. <laughs> but this guy makes this clear admission as, as day. Uh, but we find here, again, is a striking uh, proverb in and of itself. And the fact that, um, uh, listen, it doesn't take a genius for us to realize that sin is just so ingrained within our nature. Uh, we, we sometimes think that we can trust anybody and everybody. The truth of the matter is you can't. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're a politician. It doesn't matter if they're a teacher. It doesn't matter if they're a philosopher. It doesn't matter if they're a counselor. It doesn't matter if they're a philosopher. It doesn't matter uh, how old they are or how young they are. It doesn't matter any of those things because sin is so ingrained within us and it's that power, that, uh, the, the power of sin that so holds the individual that no man without, I mean, just no man can set themselves free from their sin. And uh, it's, you know, we're, we are just powerless to remove it. And uh, it's important for us to understand that, for to know how to have wisdom. To know how to have wisdom. And you see, we, we could dress up really nice. We could be saved for years and years and years and years. We could know our Bibles forwards and backwards, but I tell you, it's, it's a real struggle with, with sin. Even, even if you've been saved for a long period of time, that sin just never goes away. It's always a struggle uh, which you, you deal with. And it's realizing that man in and of himself is sinful, that we've got to understand in order to have this wisdom. And we need humility concerning our own condition. Neither any other man nor my, I myself can be fully trusted. And, and I don't like to make that admission, okay? I, I want people to say, hey, you can trust him. You can follow him. You, you, can, you can stake your life upon Him. But the very fact that we have a sinful nature, really, uh, there's only so much that we can trust. Why? Because the greatest of all people, they're still capable of falling. They're still capable of sinning. They're still capable of letting anybody down. And the Apostle Paul, and I mean this... I can imagine it's almost the same for the Apostle Paul when he thinks like, well, I'll never, I'll never let you down. 
But he makes this startling admission over in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. He says, For I know that within me, that's within my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And of course, the verse before that, verse 17, he tells us, he says, well, sin, sin dwelleth in me. That's, that's why I know that within me dwelleth no good thing. But why? Because sin dwelleth in me. And if sin's dwelling within me, I know that within me dwelleth no good thing. And so if the Apostle Paul says that, I, I'm no better than he is or, or the next man. Or, but this is something that the world in which we live in struggles with. We, we have something that is universally true, that must be accepted. And yet the world at large, and what you hear it almost every day, they try to deny the very fact that you know, people have this innate sin in which they cannot conquer. And so they come up with all these resolutions. We know what we're going to do with sin. We know, we know how to make ourselves clean. We know, we know how to make it all better. We have the answers. We're, we're, we have, are the smartest age there is in the human history. We have all this technology. We have, we have politicians and we have educators and we have this and we have that and we have the other. And if you just go through all these programs, you, we, we can make you uh, the best man you could possibly be. But even that is, is nothing. Even that is nothing. And it's sad that uh, we live in such an age of doubt. I mean, we try to explain away God and sin and everything else. And we fail to do the, the, the most important thing, which is to stare ourselves in the face and see us for what we really are. Sinners and call sin for what it is. And I believe that this is what the proverb is really directed towards. Uh, yeah, and somehow we're shocked when we look at the politics and government, the results of our education system, the counseling and so forth. And yet we see those who, who are, are, are over these. It doesn't matter if it's a teacher, it doesn't matter if it's a politician, rocked by scandal, I mean, and, and sin and just scorn and so forth. And yet those who are trusting in these things to make men better people. Well, we'll, we'll have better citizens if we, put them, if we give them the best education in the world. <laughs> look at what they produced. That's all we have to do is look at what they're producing and what's turning out. And uh, sin has consequences and there's, there's only so long that we can cover it up. And, um, you know, men are slaves to sin. I understand that. And what's on the inside so definitely want to come out. You can only hide it for so long. I think it's in the book of Numbers where it says, be sure your sins will find you out. You can respond in sin or you can respond in grace, but the sin and its nature is still present. There's only so long before we have to confess that, no, I haven't been made clean of my sin, at least not through self-effort. So we must be made clean of our sins, but the question remains as to, to how. Again, several assertions comes out of the text and, and really... I get back to the fact that it's a rhetorical question. The answer, obviously, is no. And this is what Solomon wants us to come to the conclusion of. You know, you can't, be, you can't make your heart clean. You can't uh, be pure from your own sins. You can't do it your own way. But yet, that's what everybody's trying to do. There's still this belief that uh, we can conquer uh, our sins by our, our works, eradicate it, and change our own hearts through self-effort. And it's a false premise uh, uh, in which they stand upon. And so we got to be careful with that. And uh, such an assertion is the height of foolishness. Why? Because pride uh, in the heart of man. Because the Bible says that uh, it cannot be done through self-effort. So what it boils down to is this. You know, religion's done nothing more than this. It's, it's turned people into hypocritical sinners. You look good and yet carry a Bible with you and still have sin. <laughs> Education's only made us smart sinners. You've you heard me say that before. Um, the politicians, they'll, they'll, they'll give laws and things that we're to obey, but it only makes it harder to sin, but it still doesn't remove it. And on and on down the list, we could go and look at these different ones, which we will here in just a little moment, but it still doesn't deal with the sin, sin problem, the sin nature in which we deal through all the ways that man is trying to be rid of their sin. And, and it, yet it's still there and it's still rooted in our hearts. And uh, it's amazing 
and you know this to be true, all the religions around the world, what do they do? What do they promise you? If you, go, if you do this, 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 and this, then you can be clean of your sins. And it's always that, that work in which you're to do. You know, you, uh, let's say you go to the Catholic Church and they tell you you, you, you do your baptism, you go to the catechisms, you, uh, you, when you have sins, what you ought to do is you, you, you go to the priest, you confess your sins to them, you do penance and so on and so forth. The priest is supposed to be able to tell you, hey, your sins are forgiven and all you have to do is go and do all these Hail Marys or you, you pray through the rosary beads and sometimes they even go beyond that and they say, well, yes, I understand that you sin and if you'll just do this good work, and in essence, what they're trying to tell you is, if you do these good works, it'll undo the bad work when it doesn't work that way. Jesus said, it's by grace you're saved, not through the good works or any through, through self-effort. But every religion you go to, whether it's Catholicism or Hinduism or, or, or Islam or one of these others, it's always you got to do X, Y, Z in order to get to God, in order to, to be free from your sin and, and be right with God. That's what they always tell you. And it's amazing that they have all this, all this insane. They all boil down to a works mentality that we can earn our forgiveness through doing something for God and we can be made clean from our sins. Again, the, the education. Not only the religion, but the education. And I believe we've educated people to death, don't you? I mean, they, they tell you the whole thing these days. We'll pay for you to go to college. Well, I mean, we want you to be educated to the nth degree and nobody's doing anything. <laughs> I believe we need more workers. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. We're so smart in our day and age. We've been able to do uh, anything and everything, explain away God, but yet they don't have any rational explanation for God or for sin or the creation of the world or anything like this. And it's just... Unbelievable. Unbelievable in the day and age in which we live. You know, th things that are supposed to be absolute in which they, they, they try to deny. And I've preached this a number of times, so I won't rehash it, but you understand uh, that it's a sad day when people don't know whether they're male or female and things of that nature. More people have an education in our day and age than ever before. It's, uh, uh, it used to be the fact when I was growing up now, I knew several people that dropped out in the eighth grade. And they go out and they get jobs because they had to get jobs and they would work and they, they climbed up the social ladder, so to speak. But they, they applied themselves, they worked, they may not have been the smartest people in the world, but they, they, they took care of their families, they, they were productive citizens, they did great wonders. I mean, it, it, it floored my wife, I was telling her, I forget exactly when, growing up on the farm, there was a guy that would come work for us from time to time. I don't know if I told you guys this or not, but uh, he, came, he came to work for us on the farm. The guy didn't know how to read or write. And Sarah says, you mean to tell me there's somebody that you knew that didn't know how to read or write? I'm, I'm telling you. It still happens. I mean, it's, it's less and less this day and age, but uh, with all the education people, you know what I'm finding out? The jails are still full. The prisons are still full. The mental institutions are still full. They don't have enough drugs in order to make these people um, feel satisfied or happy. Even the drugs lead to emptiness. It doesn't matter how many uh, depression medicine that you subscribe to them or, or give to them. I mean, wh what I'm saying is the solutions that we're giving them that's supposed to make them happy and take care of the, uh, the, the, the sin, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And yet we're supposed to be so smart. Then we move on to the legislation. If you know your Bible, you realize that the law was not given to take away sin. The law, of course, you know, is, is to make it harder to sin. And, uh, uh, but more or less, you come to face to face for what sin really is. And, and we realize that as good as we try to be, we always break the law. The Bible says it was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It wasn't there because it could save us. It wasn't there because it would make us better people, but it was there to bring us unto Christ. That was the whole reason for the law. It did restrict sin, yes. 
But more, more than anything else, it revealed our own sinfulness and how sinful and heinous that sin really is. The very fact that we couldn't be made righteous or pure by the law, is, it sent us running to, to Christ. God gave the provision that uh, not only if, but when we sinned, because that's what it really is, when we sin, there must be a blood sacrifice, right? <laughs> you got you to, gotta, Jesus, God said in the Old Testament, He says, when you sin, there are certain sacrifices you've got to offer. It's got to be by the shedding of blood. You know, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, is what the Bible says. So they would go through the pattern of offering up these, these blood of bulls and goats and, uh, and what have you, and they would go over and over and over again, and it can never make the man perfect. It can never cleanse his conscience. It can never really take away the sin. Well, you could cover it, yes. But again, it was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ for the one... And only true blood sacrifice, the only one that can save is Jesus Christ who went to the cross. And we are to run to the cross which is our altar uh, for our refuge, for our salvation, for the only way to be made free, for the only way to be saved, for the only way to be forgiven. Yes, He died to redeem us from all iniquity. And we ought to understand that the blood which He offered upon the altar of His cross was for our sin. He's the only sufficient Savior because not only did He die on the cross for our sins, but He was buried, rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, again, you know, everybody's trying to get there for self-effort and they're trying to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. But I like Titus chapter 2 or chapter 3 verse 5 because it does tell us how we can be washed, how we can be clean. He says this, not by the works of righteousness which we had done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing, here it is, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He did wash us. He did make us clean. He did sanctify us. He did save us. But it's through Christ's mercy. This kind of proverb, the question that the proverb puts to us does one thing. It confronts us with our sin. It shows us that we're not clean apart from the blood of Christ. It causes us to do, as the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 3, uh, it causes us to shut our mouths when God shows up. We don't have anything to answer. We don't have anything to say. In fact, Romans 3 tells us this, verses 19 to 20, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, they saith to them that are under the law and that every mouth may be stopped, and that the whole world may become guilty before God. And therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in His sight. For by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. It's the knowledge of sin. Sin's the transgression of the law. Again, Galatians 2.16 says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's not hard to understand, but yet the world misses it. They're still out there trying to work their way to heaven. They're trying to build their own Tower of Babel. They're trying to get there on their own. Man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I like the promise found in Isaiah 1.18. Come and let us reason together. Know your sin be as scarlet, I think is what it says. Yeah, though your sin be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. That's a wonderful promise. I, I like the fact that uh, uh, God does clean us. does get us all cleaned up from the inside out. can't be from the outside in. It's got to be from the inside out. We find in Jeremiah 13, that's is really amazing. The Lord confronts the uncleanness of His people. And of course, um, the nation of Israel is so far departed. God's tried to reach them over and over again. He sends His prophets rising up early in the morning. It's what He says, and continuously over and over and over again, they hear the Word of God over and over again. They deny the Word of God over and over again. They try to have it their own way. Over and over again, they try to have their religion and deny the words of God. So God confronts them, Jeremiah 13, about their uncleanness. He says in verse 10, This evil people 
which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. And you might remember the scriptures, right? Where God tells Jeremiah, what you want you to do is take a girdle, this nice girdle, I want you to go down by the riverside and I want you to uh, put it down underneath of a rock. I, want, I mean, I want you to put it down there in the muck and the mire and put it down there for several days. And then he sends them down to pull it back up again. And this is where he tells them, he says, my people should be as this girdle. I mean, it's good for nothing. It's worthless. Though they thought today it could be cleaned their own way. And so the Lord pleads with them. It's verses 15 through 18. Verses uh, 22 and 23 comes these familiar verses, particularly verse 23. Verse 22 it says, And if thou say, Here it is in thine heart, wherefore come these things upon me? And again, he told him. He says, You refuse to hear my word. You refuse to acknowledge me. You refuse to obey me. He says, well, if you, you, Wherefore, uh, if you say in your heart, Wherefore come these things upon me? For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered and thy heels made bare. Here it is. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? And then he adds this at the end. Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. He says, in other words, you know, if the Ethiopian can't change his skin, that's, that's who, who he is. And if the leopard can't change his spots, he's, he's always going to be a leopard. He's always going to have spots. That's... And what makes you think that you can be clean your own way? What makes you think that you can be pure your own way? And that's why God always draws them unto Himself. We can't cure ourselves. We can't clean ourselves of sin, cleanse ourselves of sin. The Savior's got to do that. There's nothing that they can do to change the sin nature that's so ingrained within them. It's a spiritual problem, right? And God must do the saving. God must do the changing. And then comes the question, I, I like this, Jeremiah 13, 27, Will thou be made clean? And this is what he asks everybody, Will thou be made clean? We got to... Nothing ever changes until we get, get to Christ. Think of the woman with the issue of blood. There's nothing changed about her condition until she got to Christ came and touched the hem of the garment, her blood issue was dried up, and he turned around and found the woman, and he says, uh, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Blind Bartimaeus would have continued being blind until he got to Christ. They said, Don't, don't, don't yell at the Master. Don't, don't yell for the Master. He's busy. He's traveling. <laughs> Have mercy upon me, thou son of David. And we got to come to him for his cleansing power. I can say this as a good reminder that no one, no one is without sin. First John makes that very clear, doesn't it? If we say that we have no sin, what does it say? We deceive ourselves and we make ourselves a liar. The writer at Somerset Maugham, she said this, If I wrote down every thought I've ever thought, every deed that I've ever done, men would think me the worst form of depravity. I mean, I would be scared for people to know every thought and every deed that I've ever done. So then uh, we move on now. I don't think that really Solomon really had this in, in view, the, the distinction that we have, that I'm, I've been trying to make, which is the legal aspect of it here, the legal righteousness that's given of which uh, when we come to Christ and we call upon Him to save us, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, we call upon Him uh, as our Savior to save us, He imputes His righteousness unto us, and we have that. It's in the legal matter which we're justified, we're saved, and, and positionally we're in Christ. But then there's that also the other aspect, where it's not the legal, but the practical aspect for the, for the Christian, okay? You say, well, where does it come in for the Christian? What, what does it have to do with me? Well, it still has everything to do with us. Positionally walking with Christ and, and uh, maintaining that close fellowship, and, and this speaks more or less about our sanctification. Those who have been saved by the grace of God, again, have received Christ as their Savior. They're able to stand blameless without fault in the sight of God because of what Christ did for us. 
And again, praise the Lord for that. Because of Him, we're going to stand, the Bible says, over in Romans chapter 19. And we'll be clothed with fine linen, clean and white. And that fine linen was the righteousness of the saints. That's what the Bible tells us. I mean, that's, that's going to be something else. There's going to be no condemnation, Romans 8, no separation. It has everything uh, that we've considered beforehand, but the practical righteousness here, our sanctification. The proverb here tells us, Proverbs 20, verse 9 again, who can say that they're, they're, they're clean? Who can say, I've made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. There's some people that teach this, and I'm glad that it doesn't go on here. But this whole sinless perfection, I mean, this destroys it in its face. The fact that, you know, that some people say, well, uh, because they've been saved and they received this second grace, whatever it is, oh, I no longer sin anymore. <laughs> Again, back to 1 John, that, that man would be a liar. But that's, this passage here also destroys that whole argument altogether. Because they can't say that they're clean from their own sin, except for through Christ. And there's a lot of people that try to think that they have been totally, totally, that they don't sin anymore. Now, this person might think that they have their own goodness, but the fact of the matter is they're blind to the truth. Uh, when it's right there before their eyes, I don't know how they could read through the Scriptures and think otherwise. And then, not only is there this, the idea of the sinless perfection which is destroyed, which we all know, um, but a self-righteousness that we've got to be careful of. You ever meet somebody who's self-righteous? Holier than thou? I mean, they, they've, they've dotted every I, they've crossed every T. I mean, you can't tell them they've done anything wrong. And uh, you just try to talk to them as a brother and they look down upon you. They try to point out your every sin. I mean, I mean it's just like that. I mean, the self-righteousness. And God doesn't like that either. Uh, it just really comes face to face. Galatians chapter 6, it does say this. He says... Uh, if, if any of you be overtaken to the fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. But it tells us, I believe it's in the very next verse, considering your own selves, lest you also be tempted and fall. And so this destroys this whole self-righteous attitude, the harshness toward others. And uh, Lord, forgive us of any self-righteousness. That, 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 I mean, if it's in any heart, Lord, forgive us. But it's this practical righteousness which matters to the Christian, right? 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And such were some of you, as Paul begins to detail some of the sins that the Corinthians had committed, and you know how they were uh, just boasters, blasphemers. I mean, he goes down a list of things that they were guilty of, and he says, And such were some of you. Some of you were effeminate. Some of you committed some of those sins. You looked down upon others. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And because that's true, because of uh, the fact that you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, because of that fact, He commands us in chapter 6, verse 19, I believe it is. He says, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You've been born with a price, is what He tells us. And so we're commanded to walk close to God. We're commanded to, uh, to keep ourselves pure. That's what grace teaches us. Again, I, I know I harp on that, but in our day and age, people think, well, because I have grace, I can live whichever way that I feel like it. And they have no Lord. They have no Master. They have... They've confused grace with the utter confusion of the world. And the reason for the command is because we still struggle, don't we? Galatians chapter 5. You know, you know, if you be led by the Spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. And it begins to detail all the works of the flesh <laughs> and the fruit of the Spirit. He says, now, the flesh, you still have a sinful nature, and I understand that, and you have a spirit, and these two are contrary one to another. You are, you are all constantly going to have that battle. It's always going to be there. But again, Galatians 6, you know, he that sowed to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sowed to the spirit shall of the spirit 
reap life everlasting. And we're to resist that sin, that sin nature by yielding ourselves unto God, reckoning ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So the truth remains that none of us are pure from indwelling sin, and I know no better cleansing agents than the blood of Christ and the Word of God. And that's just a fact of the matter. Uh, no one ever got a glimpse of God's holiness and uh, said this, Lord, you can't believe how clean I am and how pure of sin that I am. You can't believe how good that I am, Lord. I mean, there's nobody like me. Nobody ever said anything foolish like that. When you look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, And I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And the angels, the seraphims that were there, began to cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. I mean, and the, and the, uh, the whole temple began to shake is what He says. And then Isaiah makes a startling confession to the prophet of God. He says, Woe is, woe is me, for I am undone. Why? For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And he begins to cry out because of his own sinfulness. I can't imagine what it's like if we, when we, the day that we see God, <laughs> if it weren't for the blood of Christ, we would tremble. Job, the man that was perfect and upright and eschewed evil, and going through all of his trial, and he had some things to say, yes. When the Lord confronts him and he tells Job, he says this, I want you to stand before me and be a man. Come here. And it's such a scene where there's a discussion between the Lord and Job. Job, were you there? Job, uh, can you make a, a single snowflake? Job, can you feed Leviathan? Job, can you do this? Job, can you do that? Job, were you there? Oh, Job, I forgot. You were God? No, no, you're not God. And the Bible says this, as Job has to stand before and answer. He says, um, Behold, I am vile, and what shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, and twice I will lay my, you know, well, I remain silent, I think is what he says. And then at the end, Job chapter 42, he says this, I repent in dust and ashes. That's the kind of response that we see from somebody who approaches unto God. We realize that there's got to be a lot more humility in our day and age in which we live. We need God. We need His cleansing power. Face to face with God's holiness in mind, our only answer in the face of sin is confession and claiming the blood of Christ for our continual cleansing agent. 1 John 1.19, If we confess our sins, He's faithful to just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm glad that when we come to Christ, we can either come to Him one or two ways. You know, He could either judge, you know, or you can come to Him as your advocate. He could either be our judge or our advocate. 1 John 2, 1, and little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. But John, don't you realize? Man, I've tried so hard. What do you mean that, uh, that you sin not? J John, do you know who I am? And I've struggled and I really desire to please God in my... In my mind, I really want to please God, as, as Paul would say, but in his flesh, I'm, I fail every single time. These things I write unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, thank God for that next part, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Here it is, the righteous. And He's the propitiation for our sins. He's the Mercy seat. He is the satisfaction of the payment for everything. Past, present, future to wipe it all away because of the blood of Christ. He's a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. I love the words of uh, David in Psalm 51. In verse 6 he says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. 
Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. You know what they did with hyssop in the Old Testament, right? Hyssop was that thing that they used. Well, uh, when Moses, when they were coming to to make the covenant with God, he, Moses would take that hyssop and he would sprinkle the people with the blood and the book. Hyssop's when they use this is when you in the Exodus, uh, the, the 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 Passover that's there. He says, what I want you to do after you spill that blood, I want you to take the hyssop and strike the lentils with it and the doorposts in that form of the cross. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David recognized God's the only one that can make me clean. God's the only one that can do this. Again, he says, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The word for create is the same word back in Genesis 1-1 where he says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The same word. And in fact, every time that this one particular word is used, it's always used that God creating. Which tells us this, only God can create. Man, yeah, we say he creates, but really, what, what does he do? He, he makes things. But it's God that's got to create. I, I like, I forget which prophet it is. It might be Jeremiah. But he says, I'll give them my spirit and I'll write my laws in their heart. Only God can do that. David says in verse 12 of Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. And the amazing thing is that God promises to do so. And He delights to do so. Someone once said that the blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse excuses. Right? I mean, we're good at that. We're good at excusing sin. Well, if that person wouldn't have made me angry. I wouldn't be that way. He doesn't clean excuses. He cleans sin. He cleanses sin. The blood of Christ is a cleansing agent uh, to get clean. And I say that uh, when a, the difference between the blood of Christ for the cleansing agent for the Christian, when we come to Him, uh, you know, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse of our sins and um, all, all unrighteousness. Uh, the, only the blood of Christ can do that, and it restores fellowship, restorative as in to... Uh, bring us back to the former. Well, restore, restorative means to bring back to health, bring back to strength, re, bring back to fellowship. And that's what it does. Restore, that's what the blood of Christ does. Brings us back to where we belong. And then the, the Word of God I have here is the preventative. The Word of God's cleansing agent, but it's preventative to keep us clean, uh, to stay clean and to keep pure. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11 says this, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And see, we, we need that word to help us because we are so prone to wander, so prone to sin. John fifteen three. Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Uh, Priest on that. Uh, after the meal, John 15. And he was speaking to his disciples at that point in time. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. Uh, speaking about Christ and the church and how Christ gave himself for the church. And says this in Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it uh, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle. Carmen, this, this might help you out. You know, I guess uh, after somebody gets a, a little bit older, they go out and they buy these uh, products, right? And they call them spot remover, you know, and uh, wrinkle remover. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and they go out there to try to make themselves look better. Well, listen, here's some free spot remover, wrinkle remover right here. <laughs> it's the Word of God. And we do everything we can to clean up the outside, but God wants to clean up the inside. When I was a boy, yeah, you, you can call me strange for this, all right? As, uh, I, again, watch these shows, babysitters, so on and so forth. I used to watch Who's the Boss? You know, <laughs> Tony Dan's, uh, it, it was quite a show. In between, we had these commercials come on. And I used to love this one commercial. It's bizarre, okay? Forgive me, Martha, but Mr. Clean. 
I used to love watching that commercial. <laughs> they have these little, this dirty house, and next thing you know, Mr. Clean comes in, and with one wipe, everything's clean. The countertops, the floor, everything is just completely spotless. And growing up in the kind of home that I grew up in, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I desired. I wanted that clean life. I wanted that, uh, that, that cleanness, that niceness, that, that sparkly uh, effect. Is sparkly a word? Okay, it is now. Sparkly effect. So I used to like Mr. Clean and his commercials. Because that's what I wanted. I wanted that clean life. I wanted that uh, uh, clean lifestyle that went along with it. And you know what I found? Jesus is my Mr. Clean. He's able to clean me all up. Uh, I don't know what Mr. Clean smells like, but I'm sure it smells good, right? It looks good, smells good, and, and I mean, just, I, I associate that with the life of the Christian. Hopefully you smell good, I don't know. Don't, don't come try to smell my cologne, all right? Don't, don't do that. But smell good, look good, feel good. But I'm only able to do good through Christ. Yeah, he's my Mr. Clean. And it feels good. Many have tried to cover up their stains and stains of sin. Again, under the old covenant, God prescribed those sacrificial systems. And they would go and they would offer up the bulls and the goats and said it could never wash away those sins. It could only cover it up. But the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses that stain. It does remove it. It does take it out of the way completely. And it continues to do so all through the Christian life. Solomon said this in Proverbs 20, verse 9, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. The person who has Jesus, that's who. The person who's counting on His righteousness, walking in fellowship with Him. And we cannot be clean except for through Christ. And so we need to renounce that self-righteousness if we have any. And come to Jesus for His cleansing power. I want to Turn to Psalm 24 in closing. And just these three verses, Psalm 24. Look at the verses 3 through 5. The Bible says in Psalm 24, verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? He that hath clean hands, and you got to be clean, a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So, thank God for his cleansing power through the blood and through his word. Are you hiding his word in your heart? Are we coming to Him and say, Lord, help me with that part of my life that I struggle with, whether it's it, no matter what, He's ready to cleanse us. He's ready to make us white like snow or as white as wool. And praise the Lord for that fact. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much again for the wonderful truths that You've given to us in Your Word. And may You, again, may You wash us. May You cleanse us. May You help us, Lord, as we seek to live for You and for Your glory. And we thank You for what You're doing. And, uh, but Lord, we, we, we claim the fact that we need Your help, but we can't do it on our own. And so, Lord, would You help us? Would You help us hide Your Word in our heart? For me, it's I try to memorize these scriptures, and I tell you, it's it's work. And all we want to do is please you. I pray you help us, Lord. That we do live in a world where this, so many people think that they're okay because, well, I look good on the outside. Help us to be witnesses unto them, Lord. May you teach us and help us to live for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.